Hello, uh, my name is Dennis Allison. I organize the uh, Stanford EE Colloquium on Computer Systems. Uh, this is a part of the series of programs that we put together for uh, the uh, spring quarter of 2020. Uh, it's a little different for us now since we're sourcing the programs remotely and uh, they are all going to be uh, distributed via YouTube. In any case, uh, our speaker today is Monica Lamb. She's a faculty director of the Oval Open Virtual Assistant Lab and has for years taught uh, computer science in uh, at Stanford University. Uh, she's um, been doing some very interesting work here and uh, perhaps Alexi and Siri will have something to say about it later. Um, Monica, go ahead. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak to this uh, some in, in EE380. And uh, it's a little bit strange that this is remote. And I've been going to, I have been attending so many E380 um, talks in the past in person, but this is what we have today. And uh, well, I'm very happy to have this opportunity. So I'm going to tell you about this project. We started about five years ago. Our original motivation is really protecting privacy. And as we look ahead, we felt like the virtual we feel we 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 kind of uh, observe that the virtual assistant is going to be the um the interface that we'll be using um between you know for consumers to reach the uh digital world and for to protect privacy we have to have an open virtual assistant and for for open virtual assistants to be actually used in practice it also has to be the smartest and as a result, we have this long title, Building the Smartest and Open Virtual Assistant to Protect Privacy. We started this uh, lab called the Open Virtual Assistant Lab about uh, a few months ago, actually. Um, and we're very excited that we have a good number of um, very good colleagues joining this effort in AI, machine learning, natural language processing systems, um, as well as uh, HCI, because this is truly a multidisciplinary project. And we're very um, lucky that uh, New York Times wrote up, and wrote up an article about us, about how we aim at Alexi, Alexa and Siri with a privacy-minded alternative, right? So let's get started. Let's start with privacy. Let's, uh, we all know by now uh, with the Cambridge Analytica incident that uh, it is kind of dangerous to have a single company to own and monetize billions of people's worth, uh, billions people's worth of um, private data. And uh, with all this information, um, Facebook is an incredible, incredibly powerful advertising machine. They can advertise products, but they can also advertise the news that they want us to see, the, the thoughts, political opinions, and so forth. And they have a lot of influence, in including the influence even on our election. And um, if you think about this problem here, the, the best phrase that I have heard to summarize the situation we are in is probably the one coined by Professor Tim Wu, who is a law professor at Columbia. And he, call, he calls this the tyranny of convenience. The ultimate issue here is that consumers need convenience. If you want to protect their privacy, you have to give them something that is convenient. And the biggest problem we have today is that there is just no meaningful choice. It's not like they can say, oh, I don't want um, a, a company that owns my data. Um, but there is really no easy way for them to share this information, to share their personal information. And this is something that the technologists have to, um, have to understand and have to say, if you want privacy, you have to address this tyranny of convenience. So that's what happened. And um, with the kind of a monopoly that we see here, it's really too late to try to create an alternative to Facebook. What we need to do is to look forward to the next big thing. We all know um, that 
you know, the, the com computer science always evolves and there will be the next interface. And what we need to do is to protect the next one. And the next one is going to be the virtual assistants for sure. Voice is the, is the new interface. Okay, this is a huge um, paradigm shift. You know, when we first have the PCs, we have to invent the mouse, we have to invent the display. But now we have these little mobile devices and we have ubiquitous, we have smart speakers. You can just interface with the computer using the using language. Okay, language is how we talk to each other. And this, with machine learning, we can now use language to talk to computers. So voice is obviously huge. And, and virtual assistants have an incredibly compelling um, val, uh, value proposition. You know, today we sign up to this website, after, you know, that website, and we have all these different accounts. All our data are siloed in many different web, uh, web services. We have to log into each one of them and do whatever we, we need to do. So what the virtual assistants offer here is like, just give me all the passwords. I can get access to all the websites. And I give you a personalized interface to all these different websites. Um, you don't have to worry about uh, looking up, you know, the, going through all the menus and doing X, Y, Z, clicking here, clicking there. Or in the same way, if you look at the mobile apps, look at the IoT devices that you install around the house, um, you want to be able to just talk about them uniformly. So with all this information, they will, they will totally uh, revolutionize how we do everything from searching to buying anything. It's like, you don't have to say what you want to buy because they can read your email and they know, oh, you're planning, say, a trip in 2021, okay? <laughs> um, and it will actually go and help you find the tickets and so forth because they know your habits, right? In other words, the virtual assistant is going to be the new interface to how we uh, interact with the digital world. And um, as a result of that, they have a lot of power on, on what services we'll be using and they can market a lot of information uh, on top of products, news, political inconvenience, whatever we have been seeing in Facebook, for example, it's gonna be even more effective when we get into this virtual system that sees all of our personal data. So what we can expect here is that whatever we know of Google, Amazon, Facebook, imagining all of that combining to be owned by the virtual assistant. And what is also worrisome here is that there is a duopoly already emerging. Alexa has 70% of the 76 million installed base of owners in the US, all right? Um, and I think Google is like 25%. And um, the other thing here is that they are not just a way for you to talk to Amazon services. They actually have a pretty incredible third party platform. Right now, there are over 100,000 different skills on this platform. So through Alexa, you can talk to many different services. So in a sense, you can think of Alexa as like the new browser. Using the browser, you can visit all the different pages, except the difference here is that they own those skills. It's open to people to put, you know, you can put your skills in, but it is a proprietary platform. They can choose to close it. They can choose to ask for a fee if you want to be connected um, through them. If you want to say you want to sell through us, where I may, since this is my platform, I can put on a fee, just not that different from how app stores today um, takes a cut on a, uh, on, uh, I think that that's a 30% cut on the revenues that mobile device, uh, mobile apps make. Okay, so they have a lot of control. Besides the skills, they also have 60,000 compatible IoT devices. Those are the last numbers we looked up and maybe there are even more at this point. And in order to make all this happen, they also they have uh, employed you know, over 10,000 people working on Alexa. That is a lot of, um, this is a huge platform. And what we are witnessing in a sense is a proprietary linguistic web in the making. So this can 
this is uh, very worrisome. There are three major different threats that are important here. The first one is privacy. Will there be one or two uh, virtual assistants that see billions of people's private data? So that's one. The second one is that it is a platform for that through which you get uh, to learn about uh, products, you buy products and so forth. So will they become a platform that controls what are the services that are being uh, that, that we can get access to. So this uh, potentially can close the market and without having an open market, it also threatens innovations. And the third problem here is that if all the technology of virtual assistants are owned by just these couple of companies, then is, does it mean that they are the ones who are going to put up all the services? I mean, they're going to serve um, the kind of, you know, to, 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 they get to pick what, they, what they're doing, which is very different from the web. Anybody can put up on a website in the language they choose to. So the question is, would it be the problem, would it be the case that the, uh, the um, social good projects or underserved classes may not have a chance to take advantage of the virtual assistant technology? Uh, what about the rare languages? I mean, would they be covering all the languages, even though they may not be the most profitable languages to worry about? Okay, so these are three major issues that, um, that are at hand here if we do see a um, monopoly or a duopoly. The tricky part here is that virtual assistant technology is really hard. There is a huge technical barrier to entry. Right? The fundamental issue here, we are dealing with natural language processing. And we know um, at this point our best tool is neural networks, and neural networks needs training data, needs annotated training data. And um, if you want training data, then you really need to have users. So almost it, what is expected in terms of a prerequisite is you have to have millions of real users. And there are very few companies that have access to all this real data. All right, so this makes it very hard. But, some, but we also have to realize that with this approach, there are a lot of deficiencies. If you are annotating real data, um, data, ish, uh, data from users, there is a privacy issue. But if you look at the performance side of things, there's a whole long list of issues that is uh, worrisome. The first is the cost. We already know that, they, that Alexa has like over 10,000 employees, all right? And we know um, this, you know, there are not too many companies that can afford that. Um, second question is coverage. There are just lots of many possible utterances. Can we really annotate all of the data that we, all the conversations that we need? Third is robustness. A lot of dialogues today, you know, dialogues today are, are mainly um, uh, designed or, or crafted uh, you, these conversational agents are crafted using dialogue trees where you lay out the possible questions and, and the kinds of answers that you're expecting. And it is very cons constrained, but in practice, we talk about many things, we change topics and so forth. So how do we make, it, make the system more robust? There's an issue also of accuracy. There is, the, you know, of course we worry about the accuracy of training, in the meantime, we discovered that as we try to annotate data, it is also very easy to make mistakes in the annotations. And we will talk about an example with uh, the multi was that we saw in the multi was dead benchmark. Then there is a the question of bootstrapping, all right? You don't have the users or you have a new feature or new, uh, new service that you roll out. Uh, how do you get training data? How do you even start? Then there is the issue of scalability. We talk about how the assistant allows you to reach like the web linguistically or by voice. There are 1.8 billion websites out there. There, you know, we, there are lots of possible dialogues that can be made out of those websites. And there are thousands of natural languages being used. So 
how are we going to scale with this approach? So uh, let's summarize here is that there are many uh, standard performance bent for performance metrics uh, that are um, not done well with this approach. And um, I'm so if I look at all the list here, I'm going to coin this term uh, CCRABS to represent all the six uh, six um, different metrics. And we're just going to pronounce this as crabs. Okay? <laughs> uh, these are issues that we have to address if we really want to see the full potential of the vir of virtual assistants. Let's take a look at what we think will happen if we develop this technology well, hopefully with the help of a lot of people, um, because the, 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 the scope of the virtual assistant is really large. The first thing we are saying here is that we're gonna expect the whole web to go voice accessible, right? It's going to change how we do some the standard search process. You're going to be able to use your history, emails, calendar. You can even talk about what you really care to look for and so forth. So it changes search. With voice, we can automate what we want to do um, without having or asking some developer to write up the code. Uh, there are personal tasks like ordering groceries, food uh, these days, paying bills. It would be nice to be able to automate what you want to do, um, what you normally do on the website. But more importantly, when you think about jobs that people do, the doctors, the stocks, the stockbrokers, the loan officers, and so forth, or, or teachers, they can also automate their processes. The concept here is that if I can use voice, I can automate this process. And what we are seeing here is this concept of natural language programming. Um, we've been working on making programming easier and easier, but imagine we can now just look at net, just have consumers use natural language and they can automate their own tasks. It's a huge concept. So um, when we think about automation, it's what we do, um, what we ask the computer to do, then the next step is that the computer can help us, can advise us what to do. It can, examples are like fitness, bodybuilding, um, it, you know, you get to finances, education, careers, and so forth. And as an advisor, they can really influence our behavior for good or for bad. It is a lot of, you can manipulate our behavior and so forth. So there is a lot of um, power that these virtual assistants can have on the individuals. As you can see here, you know, there is a long um, list of things that will happen with the development of virtual assistants. And today there are like 23 million web interface, uh, web developers writing HTML codes and so forth. I believe that in the future, we are talking about 23 million voice interface developers because everything needs to have a voice interface. So, Given this vision here, we really can, we really need to improve the methodology for creating virtual assistants to address all the standard metrics that, um, that we care about in computer science. This, with this methodology, what we would really like to have is a tool set that enables the 23 million developers to easily create their interfaces um, in, and instead of just relying on annotating real life sentences. So what we, are what we need to do is to create these tool set. We have created a, a prototype system. Um, a, a, I, it's a working system, but it's still got a lot of room for improvement for sure. The system is called Genie and it en empowers developers to build skills. And also consumers can start using this to automate some of their tasks and I can uh, get into details next. So the method new methodology, new tool set. And on top of that, we have created two platforms. The first one is called Thinkpedia. It's a little bit like Wikipedia, right? It is a crowdsourced repository. You can put the skills in here. It is open and it is non-proprietary. That means that any skills that you put into this Thinkpedia is open to everybody to open to all virtual assistants. This is kind of like the open 
uh, internet, right? Anybody can put up an HTML page, and you can, you know, you with all, you know, you can create a new browser and visit all the existing pages. You don't have to have to create the skills for your own browser. So this is the first. This is uh, this is one of the important platforms, and that's Thinkpedia. The second is that we have also built a uh, a a prototype virtual assistant. It's called Almond that uses Thinkpedia skills. And Almond is different from all the other commercial assistants in the primary way of how it protects privacy. It has a federated architecture, and it supports interoperability and and thereby it also protects privacy and i will describe that uh, at towards the uh, that's the third uh, topic um, in the next talk and the next part of the talk and what i want to focus on now is to go back to talk about the new methodology for building virtual assistants and the tool sets that we have created all right just as we get into the technical side of things, the methodology, let's start with um, how do how do virtual assistants today build their, you know, how are, uh, the virtual assistants are built today. Okay, so let's start with Alexa. And Alexa has a representation they call AMRL, the Amazon Meaning Representation Language. And this language is syntax dependent. So for example, if I take a sentence like search for an upscale restaurant and then make a reservation for it, it maps into some logical form. I don't want to get into the details, so I'm just going to give you this high level picture. Imagine the left side says upscale restaurant, the right side says uh, make a reservation, okay? But if you take this example of a sentence, I can say it in many different ways. If I say reserve a high-end restaurant for me, that sentence means exactly the same thing, but it actually will be annotated differently because of the of the uh, because of the syntax of this sentence. And what it means is now is that the same meaning can be represented in different um, ways, right? And this is uh, syntax dependent. So it also means that if I give you a different language. Right, such as Chinese here. I mean, the representation may be different, and and um, and so forth. So it just means that this annotation task is very complex. It's difficult, and it is not the same as asking a um, crowdsource worker. Uh, if you look at a picture, whether it's a cat or a dog, okay, you really need to get trained in order to do a good job in creating the logical representation of those sentences. Okay, so that's how they represent this information. So the Alexa, first you have to annotate and then you take all this information and then you train the neural network to generate the, uh, the information in their representation. Then there is a second step. The second step is that given the AMRL, then you have to interpret it and then you decide what it is asking for, what it is asking you to do, and then you have to execute it. So it is done in two steps. So we have, we cannot afford this, okay? They have 10,000 employees. We started with one PhD, two PhD. Now we have about four PhD students working on the AI side of things. I cannot afford this approach and, and neither can most companies. So we have to come up with a new methodology as we discussed and a new approach to this problem. So the first idea is that we have an end-to-end -end translation uh, technique. The first most important observation we make made is that I am really not trying to understand full-blown natural language. All right, what we are trying to do is human-computer interaction, and what the what what the users have or the humans have to say to the computers is just what we want the computers to do for us. All right, so um, it's like us with a dog, you know, we just want the dog to understand, uh, shake hands or lie down, right? We're not going to start talking about fancy philosophies, poetries, and so forth. Okay, so it is much more limited than human conversations. And then the second part is that it is a computer. What can it do? 
we know, we know, I mean, at the best, it is Turing complete. So whatever the computer, the computer can do, we can describe its capability in a programming language. Okay. It, we, we know eventually it tries to execute something. That was the second step in the virtual system. We know that if that is the case, we can just summarize what exactly the computer can do with a language. This language, uh, it's we, because it is something that the virtual assistant needs to do. Uh, it is not a language that we are, we have in the past. So we actually came up with this language. We call this thing talk. It's the way things talk to us. All right. So, so this is a brand new language that is intended for this purpose. Uh, it can capture the capability of the computer. And it's a language that is extensible. We expect more and more as we improve or increase the capability of the virtual assistants, we will increase the power of ThingTalk. Um, and it is absolutely independent of the source language, the natural language. And that is very, very important. Okay. And given that, then now we, we can so the task here is that we can take what we want to do is to take text and then translate it into the meaning which is captured by an executable representation okay it is formal and it is executable whatever you want the computer to to do you can capture it um, using this language so you can see a little bit like here um, search for an upscale restaurant, make a reservation. It boils down to calling, in this case, say a Yelp API, get a get the result, uh, pick something that is expensive, and then you reserve the restaurant. Okay. So as you see here, the query language and the natural language have ver are very close in uh, the level of abstraction, and this is the reason why the natural language translation has a chance. So this language is really designed to be uh, generated from natural language. So now what we are talking about is an end-to-end -end translation. So you have a neural network that takes the English sentences and generate code. And what we have skipped is the intermediate level of representation. All right. We, what we are saying here is that I just give you the training end to end and let the neural network come up with the intermediate representation. It's, that's what it is good for. Okay. So, so that's idea number one. Um, so with this representation, you've got a unique semantic, we, we made the language canonical. It means that there is always one, uh, for, the, for whatever you want to say, there is one ident one unique representation for that semantics. And this is very important to be able to train the neural networks well, okay? You, whatever way, different ways you are saying it, it boils down to the same exact program, okay? So here are just all the different sentences that can, that would translate into that sentence, uh, into that code. Another thing we can do, if you look at it from this way, is that if I look at that code, I can paraphrase it. I can say this, this code in many, many different languages. With this, you can even use machine translation to help you generate data. If you have a corpus of English uh, that is English in code, and if you have a perfect machine translator that translates English, say, into Chinese, then I automatically will have a, um, will be able to handle the, uh, uh, this uh, translation from natural, from Chinese to code, okay? So that's the first idea. The second idea here is that we really need to apply the CS, the computer science software engineering approach to get the training data. We really don't want to just say, uh, just go with the current uh, methodology, which is that you have to have a lot of data, the big data, and then we have annotators. We heard that there are countries that have data factories, okay, that annotate data, and a lot of, um, of, of people annotating. And then you generate the training data, and then you use it to train the neural network. 
And if the result is not good, then you have to go find more real data and do more annotations. And hopefully that will give you the accuracy that you need. All right. So that is a pretty, we, we, we discuss how it doesn't have the crabs uh, uh, properties. Okay. So instead, what we're saying here is that we need natural language data, but we want small amount of it. We can only afford that. And we take the small amount of data and the engineers are going to amplify it. Okay, you look at the small data and using the tools that we have, we can generate a lot of training data. And then you use this to get a, a tr to train the neural network. And the second part that is most important here is that when the neural network doesn't behave, we can now look at it and have the engineers or have the tools automatically tune the system by generating more training data in order to improve the neural network. The ability to refine the process is absolute key. Okay, so what I want to do in this talk is to give you a high level uh, overview of three results that we have gotten using this methodology. We we'll start with Q and A dialogues, um, and then we talk about how we handle IOTs and privacy. So Q and A. Um, so today, if you look at Alexa, the, if you wanted to answer questions, you have to hand code roughly the training data one by one. The training data corresponds to question and code. If you give me this question, this is the code that will get you the answer, okay? And one by one, that's a lot of work, right? What we are doing, however, is that we are going to rely on synthesis in order to get a lot of the training data. Remember, we, we, we generate a lot of data from a small amount of natural data, natural language sentences. And if you want to create an agent, um, all you have to do in this using this tool chain is to supply the schema all right, of the uh, information that you want to um, create a QA agent for. Suppose I'm doing restaurants. It, well, the schema would have the name, the price, cuisine, and so forth. Okay, And then you do a little bit of uh, field annotations to talk about how you use natural language to describe some of these fields. And that's all you, that's all the restaurants come, restaurants have to do. Okay. And what we provide is a whole bunch of domain independent templates. There are about 500 of them. Okay. But the best part of this is that it is domain dependent. Whether you're talking about hotels, you're talking about restaurant, uh, restaurants, taxis, drive, whatever, it doesn't matter. It is the same set of templates. We do it once, once and for all for a natural language. So if you take that, then we have a tool and it automatically generates a whole bunch of sentences that can be derived or that can be answered using the schemas. And um, we put in joins, you, you know, we, we, you can do projections, you can, you can do comparison and so forth. And all these sentences are just, try, just directly generated. You don't have to code them up one at a time. So that's a high level picture. Let's go down one level. So we said that the user has to provide the schema, the few annotations. All this information goes into Thinkpedia, which is the platform of all of um, how, how things work, okay? How we can use voice to uh, interact with these things. So that is the, uh, what the user supply. And then the rest of it is what the tool, tools supply, all right? So we have a tool, it takes thing talk grammar, and that part is also parameterized, but of course we have already got the grammar for Q&A. And on top of that, the templates that we talked about, you know, what, it, so for example, we generically we say, what is the field of table or what is the table's field? Like what is the cuisine of the restaurant and what is the restaurant's cuisine, all right? So you substitute with different domains, you get different Q&A uh, Q agents. So you take that, you synthesize the sentences in the code, and you take a small percentage of that, and you ask the um, 
you ask uh, crowdsource workers to do a little bit of paraphrasing. So we typically, I would say, take less than 1% of the data um, and ask for the paraphrasing. Getting some amount of natural language sentences is really important to complement the millions of sentences that we synthesize. Now you take all that and we add, we, 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 we take the sentences and we augment with parameters and data and we generate millions and millions of sentences and we send it through the for, send it through um, a neural network to train it. The most important thing that we do that we learn in this process is that um, while we are training with this paraphrase and synthetic sentences, you cannot evaluate with that. You absolutely have to validate and test it with real user input and use that to, to, uh, to tune the, the neural network. If you just stick with the paraphrase and synthesize sentences, you can get a model that works very well, okay, but fails in real life. So the key here is that we have to get a small, small amount of information, but it is a tiny fraction of what you need for training. And you use that to do the evaluation. What, happen if in, in, what happens is that the first round, when you do that, you will find that it, the, the neural network, we call it LUINet, by the way, it stands for the Linguistic User Interface Network. The first round, it doesn't do that well, but then it, you can now look at the errors and you figure out what is it that your synth synthetic sentences miss. You put in those components into the system and you add in a few more templates in order to cover the ideas that are missing. The key here is that you are just throwing in some of the missing components and the synthesizer will automatically take the component and combine it with all the different components to generate sentences that you have not seen in practice. And this is very important because if you just see one particular combination, um, the neural network can very easily um, over, you know, overlearn and just didn't realize that these are concepts that can be combined with other things. So the key here is that this approach is how we teach the neural network compositionality. Okay. So, oh, that's the validation. All right. So what can we do? Here are some examples of sentences that we um, tried and we tested it on Alexa, Google, Siri, and us. And um, as you can see here that we can answer all these kinds of questions, but the commercial assistants don't do that well on them. So for example, if I say, show me restaurants rated at least four stars with at least 100 reviews, we all know that if there are only a couple of reviews, we should really discard the, the rating. Um, and so it is a very natural sentence, but that is the kind of sentences that we can do, but we didn't see any other assistant doing it. Because what's going on here is that uh, these kinds of sentences require us to do joins of information in, uh, in, the, uh, in the schema, in the databases. And um, because we are kind of generating the program directly from the sentences, using a neural net network that was taught compositionality, we were able to answer these kinds of questions. So these are just a sample. We also ran an experiment where we crowdsourced uh, 400, about 400 restaurant queries. Um, what we did is that we asked the uh, crowdsource workers, it's like, given this kind of properties about restaurants, can you come up with sentences that use two of these properties? Okay, so these are not your regular questions, which is, what is the top restaurant? in Palo Alto, <laughs> okay? Um, a lot of people, you know, everybody can answer that. But the kind that I was just showing you, what is a Chinese, you know, Chinese restaurant in Hawaii uh, that has rating above four? That kind of thing, that would really, that will stump some of these uh, assistants. And what we see here is that uh, we are reaching close to 75%, whereas Alexa and Siri ranges from 30 some to like 50-ish um, results. So we're pretty excited. Um, we, this, you know, we have a small team 
And what we are focusing on is really teaching um, questions that can be answered from a database. We kind of go backwards, and as a result, we get better coverage, we get better accuracy. Um, and those are the ways we address the collapse metrics that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so, so that's the first result we see is that we can answer complex queries more accurately. Um, now let's talk about dialogues. Okay, that is what people really want. I mean, I don't want to just give you commands uh, and get what answer. I want to take turns and describe, discuss this. So uh, to start, let me show you how we build um, dialogues today. Uh, it's, it's just typical that we use dialogue trees, but it is very laborious and extremely brittle. So here is an example going back to the restaurants. Um, it starts by the agent saying, hello, how can I help you? And at that point, the agent is now looking for the high level intent, such as I'm looking to book a restaurant for Valentine's Day. So this matches to this reserve action. All right. This is in natural language understanding. There's an intent in a slot as like, okay, restaurant. Then it has a model given this restaurant. I say I can, given this reserve I know that you're trying to reserve something. I can ask you for more information, elicit slot, or I can show you some results, or I can show you some recommendations. But say in this case, it goes, it, it, the, the system chooses to ask for a clarification, elicit so, uh, slot. And it, there is a hard coded, roughly hard coded sentence saying something like, what kind of restaurants are you interested in? And at this point, the, the uh, system has a set of following up intents. Okay, the, there are certain things I expect you to be saying. So for example, uh, Terun on California Avenue. Well, that is exactly one of the things that we expected. It's like, okay, you gave me the name, I'm ready to go, okay? But if you, if you say something like something that has pizza, okay, that I can understand because I'm expecting food equals to pizza. But if you are not saying anything that it is expecting, then whoa, right? it cannot deal, it cannot handle it. So suppose you did not expect the user to say, I don't know, what do you recommend? All right, surely I have, uh, you know, as you can see in this diagram here, I know how to recommend things. But at, under the illicit slot case, I didn't expect you to be saying it, and I just don't know. And at that point, I kind of fall, fail out of this tree. And this is the reason why it is very brittle. So what I show you here is an example of a conversation that a like a restaurant interface developer may, may uh, lay out. But in reality, this conversation state is much more complicated. So, um, so, so that's one issue. The second issue is that if I now have to train um, some a system at, uh, at the level of dialogues, okay, as opposed to just looking at classification of intents, uh, which is also work that is being done here, is to say, if you want to understand a full dialogue, you have to annotate these dialogues one at a time. There are lots and lots of possible dialogues out there. And even if I pay for a lot of uh, annotations, it doesn't necessarily mean that you give me a new dialogue, I'll be able to handle that really well. And on top of that, um, we discovered that it was actually very hard to do a good job. Um, there is a, uh, uh, a dialogue um, data set called multi -WAS. It is actually multi-domain dialogues. And what we discovered, I mean, the, the, the research community has discovered there is roughly about 30% error in the annotations themselves. And if you train with this, data set that has 30% error, you know, you're not getting 70% accuracy even, all right? So, so there is this other issue here is the annotating dialogues and relying on a, a dialogues, a, annotated dialogues to uh, get you the training data you need is problematic. Okay, so let's go back to the first question, which is the state size. So, what we did is that we looked at some of the um, the dialogue data. That's our small data in a sense. We look at 
a, a sample of that. And we realize that the states are a lot more complicated. So we extracted a dialogue state machine for transactions. So here is a, a, a representation of that. And so, for example, I can start, I can greet the yellow, the or, sorry, the orange nodes here represent um, what the, let me see. Uh, um, so the orange is what the agent is saying, okay? Um, and then, oh, sorry, the orange is what the user says, and then the green is what the agent says. Okay, and as you can see here, there is a quite a bit of complicated flow. But the good news here is, is this 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 uh, model, this dialogue state for transactions, is kind of independent of what domain it is. So it is possible for you to kind of put this domain, th this dialogue state together, and you know whatever work you are doing here can be reused across all the different domains. So using this we are able to create a technical stack that is very modular, very reusable. And um, so if it is a domain that we have already uh, done work on, so for, for example, restaurants, then a single, some restaurant can come along and use this tool by simply supplying knowledge about it, its particular you know, about that particular restaurant, like what cuisines they serve and what's the price range, what kind of ratings they get. They supply this and we are able to generate for, for the business a uh, reservation agent, okay? So they don't know, need to know anything about AI, nothing about training, and they get an agent, okay? But if you look underneath the hood, it is a whole stack of different tools um, and I've already given you all the major ingredients or components. Um, first, it is about it's a domains. Okay. In other words, so here is an example. Restaurants means I'm going to use the restaurant schema, restaurant reservation API, and some annotated small data. So if you want to do something that is not in that domain, then you will have to supply that level of information. Underneath that, uh, the next level uh, in the stack is these domain independent sentence templates, okay? And, um, and this is language specific. We put a whole, uh, there are about 500 of them right now, and it is useful for all the different domains. For transactions, we have a transaction dialogue state model, but in the future, we expect to see more state models. If given this information, we can automatically synthesize you dialogues after dialogues, okay? So the data says, I might be the state, uh, and under the state, I look up the table and I supply the content about that particular domain or particular restaurant, and I can start spewing out millions and millions of dialogues, which can then be used to do, can be used for training. And then at the end of that, you get a, a restaurant reservation agent. Okay, so one interesting project we are doing here, uh, we've got a, uh, a, a draft of uh, a submission of a paper that uses schema.org uh, data. Schema.org is the schema that is used by a lot of web pages. So if we're able to take, by, by working on schema.org, we can potentially take um, you know, millions of web pages um, in the, on the internet and make it voice accessible. Okay, so um, we talked about a neural network. This neural network is different, is, is kind of unique. It's one of a kind. Uh, it's for dialogues. And what is new about it is that instead of just, just seeing all the sentences, for each turn, we use a context to summarize all the sentences that I have seen, I've heard up to this point. And this context is formal. So for example, I may know that you are talking about a restaurant and um, you've got information already uh, about location and so forth. So that's the input context. So what we, ask, uh, what we add to it as input is the next user sentence. The next user sentence comes in, we go through this neural network, and at the end of that is a, is a new context that summarizes 
you know, the whole, the, 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 now the entire conversation, you know, basically the old context plus the new sentence and the output is the new sentence. Uh, sorry, the output is the new context. As you can see here is that our approach is to make everything really formal. This is the only way we can really say that we understand what the users are saying. And so that's the diagram of the neural network. And, um, and um, you know, there will be more details in, in the upcoming paper. So the preliminary results that we have uh, seen is that um, by using only synthetic data, we have can achieve a turn by turn accuracy of 60% on the domain of restaurants in multi -walls. We're very excited about that result. And this is really early stage result and we have to do more work on more domains and so forth. But I think that this concept of um, just getting a table and automatically we generate you the training data as well as the agent at the end of that that can respond, that, that, will, that can converse with the user is really exciting. Then um, there is another experiment that we have done uh, using this um, kind of approach. And that is, um, it, it's a zero shot learning result. Um, we mentioned multi was a number of times. It's a multi-domain dialogue benchmark. And what we try to do is to say, suppose I have training for training data for N domains. When I want to go to a new domain, is it possible for me to transfer the learning for the end domain, so I don't have to have to do all the work all over again for the new domain. So this is the idea behind um, transfer learning. And in our experiment, it's a zero shot learning, meaning that I will withhold all the training data for the domain of question, okay? Um, so suppose I am interested in domain X, we, 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 we we take all the original real training data and we replace the real training data of domain X with just synthetic data. It costs us basically nothing. We just, we, we basically withhold all the real data, put in the train synthetic data for X, and then we train with all the different domains and then we test on the domain X, okay? And we discovered that our synthetic data takes you up to, 73% of what you can achieve using uh, real data to train. So this is, a, this is a good result because it saves people a lot of effort in creating, uh, in, in, in gathering uh, annotated uh, data. And this result will be coming up in the ACL conference this year. And so those are the two results, it's like, we are able to answer complex questions more accurately. We now have the first neural dialogue state machine. And the third topic is IoTs and privacy. That was our original mo mo motivation of this work. So to start with, what we have done is that we separated the AI from the execution, all right? Today, the translation from natural language to ThinkTalk is done in the cloud because we haven't finished, we're not done with the training, right? But in the future, once it is trained, it is, pos it is possible and it is probably um, more cost effective and definitely better for privacy if the inference is done locally, okay? But nonetheless, the translation from natural language to the command in formal language does not cause a huge privacy issue in the following way. Suppose I say, what is my checking account balance? You know that in the cloud, it, know, it knows that I'm asking for that. All it does is to translate that English into the command of checking my checking balance. The code, the, pass, the code is actually executed by the virtual assistant. Our virtual assistant is called Almond. And we have a version that runs completely locally on your own devices. So the passwords, execution, the return result, it's only seen by Almond on your own device. Okay, so this is the way for us to give the user full uh, privacy of their data. So 
so in our system, you know, it's like I well, what I expect is that people to have choice to have choice. And the second thing that we really need to make sure of is that we can share our information. Uh, we know that by by with Facebook by providing sharing, Facebook was able to gather the data from billions of people's uh, from billions of people. So what we are saying here is that sharing is very fundamental to what people need. So we bake that into our system from day one. Okay. So that means that I have my local system, you may have your local system, and for us to, to share, we have a standard protocol for these assistants to talk to each other. That's why it has a, it, it, this is a federated architecture. The protocol is actually very rich. It is think talk and it is remote think talk. Okay, so anything that I can do, I can share with my friends. I will show you more details later. All right, so um, one thing I want to mention is that, uh, that Allman has been integrated with Home Assistant, which is an open source community of about 100,000 people. And what they have is an open source gateway, and it's already connected to hundreds of different IoTs. And so, and what Allman is, is a voice interface to the local gateway. So now you can use Almond to talk about your thermostats or security camera. None of those information from the IoT devices ever need to leave your house. It will just be managed by the home assistant gateway and then we provide you with the voice interface to it. So our, our um, assistant, our IoT assistant is actually a, a much more powerful than the commercial ones. Um, we don't just help you turn on the light, turn on the TV and so forth. We actually let you have these event-driven um, operations. Uh, so here I want to give you an example um, to, so that you can understand the, the uh, uh, you, know, you, you look at this scenario to understand the power of this technique. So for example, Bob. Bob is, an, is unfortunately an asthma patient um, and there are a lot of things a lot of IOTs out there that can help him but ha having all men which is a, a virtual assistant that supports privacy is great because he doesn't have to disclose his condition to anybody uh, uh, you know, to, to anybody at all he has full privacy so with um, with what we have done uh, Bob can for example um, use uh, Almond to help him manage his conditions. He can say to Almond, it's like, when I use my inhaler, record my GPS location in this log file on box, okay? Because he might want to know where he normally gets his uh, asthma attacks. And it is not something that he will care to do as he, as he is getting his attack. But every time he picks up the inhaler, the IoT inhaler, it can automatically trigger this kind of a command that assist the, the um, uh, almond assistant can do for you. Or Bob can say, you know, I, I'm worried I may be taken to the hospital and I want to, you know, it's like almond, let my dad know if I'm at the hospital. So Almond is the virtual assistant that keeps track of where Bob is the whole time. Every, uh, you know, but unless he gets into trouble, like being taken to the hospital, his father doesn't know where he, he is. All right. So the assistant is providing the communication of information when it is needed according to Bob's instruction. In the same way, he, this information can be shared with the doctor and the doctor, for example, can monitor Bob's um, flow meter. And um, the doctor can also tell his assistant, tell the assistant that um, when, if the, like when the air quality index is above some level and you know, Bob is running, please warn him, just tell him to stop. Okay, so now you can kind of have uh, a combination of information about Bob's activities, environment, and so forth. And the virtual assistant um, being private is, uh, has, is, you know, is, as you can see here, has 
information about Bob with, and, and Bob doesn't have to worry about having any of this information leaking to a third party. But as you can see here, there's a whole lot of different commands. This is specific to Bob. And um, with the natural language programming, he is able to just say what he wants instead of trying to ask somebody to code all these little programs up for him. Okay, so that's the idea behind, um, behind our work. So what I have shown you was a think talk for queries. We have also extended think talks, think talk to let you have event driven, event triggered commands. Okay. So for example, a command like when I use my inhaler, get my GPS location, if it is not home, write it to log file in box, it's actually translated into this thing talk syntax. Um, three lines on the natural language side, three lines on the code size monitoring the inhaler use, getting the GPS, checking for the location, and do it, checking the result, and writing into the box uh, file, okay? So this high-level construct is, um, I mean, this has a very simple grammar. Um, it is when something, get something, do something. But the power comes from the fact that this is hooking up all the different Thinkpedia operations, uh, cooking up all the different operations, the inhaler, the GPS, the box, all these APIs are stored in Thinkpedia. And ThingTalk is just a little control construct that combines all these things together. And, um, and you don't have to remember how each, each of these APIs are described in Thinkpedia because the LUI net, the neural network, will be able to handle natural language versions of the left-hand side, the, the sentences, you know, it just, it, it, it makes it, you don't have to use the same words uh, with this neural network, it will still know what you are trying to say. Okay, so that's the high level idea. So right now we have, um, besides the home assistant help of uh, IOTs, there are a whole bunch of um, social, social media and common uh, websites, information, APIs that are included in Thinkpedia today. And um, so this is not, this is a little bit more, this is fancier than schema. Schemas is always like you're doing joins, projections, and uh, field lookup and stuff like that. But for IOTs, they are, a lot of times it's one of a kind. So if you look at Twitter, um, so you can say uh, there are APIs for monitoring tweets, and then the user has to supply for example, how monitoring works. So I can say when at Stanford tweets, it corresponds to this code on the right. So, so what people have to supply, uh, it, it's kind, this is kind of like the equivalent of the field annotations. Here's the API call, here's a snippet. The API call, snippet. So that's what the Thinkpedia or the, uh, what the Thinkpedia rep uh, repository is about. Okay, and then ThingTalk hooks them up together. It allows the information from all these different devices to interoperate. Um, we have not seen anything like this in, the, in, in commercial assistance. So ThingTalk has a very simple grammar, when, get, and do, but it also has a lot of filters, a lot of predicates. And with this simple construct, all the things that I were talking about could be mapped into this Thing talk grammar, okay. The the red is the when, get is the orange colored, and then the greens are the do's, and then so you can generate many many possible sentence uh, programs using natural language. So these are all the things that I can get my assistants to do. And the interesting thing here is that we for we can also turn it around for sharing, okay. When we so whatever your assistant can do, the results can be shared with anybody you care to share with. All right, and all we have to do is to tick the sentences and add one more um, component to it, and that is that you can you can uh, designate or specify who can execute those commands. So, for example, I can say let Dr. Smith 
monitor my peak flow meter if it drops below that level. Or I can say, let my secretary, whenever I'm out of town, read my email messages if the subject is marked urgent. Okay, so this is a very um, detailed description of who, when, how, what the, uh, the person uh, can see, uh, topic by topic. All right. What I do for emails are very different from my health records. Um, another example here is that, for example, with COPPA, websites need to know that um, you have a user under 13. So I can say let websites know I'm under 13 years old and so forth. Okay. So with natural language, you can really describe all kinds of different um, access controls in a very natural way. And I think this is something that the, the world needs. And so far, our uh, access control for consumers are uh, in pretty bad shape. You know, you can share with friends or friends of friends, but you really cannot put in all these conditions, as you can see here, that is meaningful to people. All right, so now I wanna show you how we can do sharing. So here is an example, okay. Suppose the dad says to his daughter, um, he says, well, you know, you are always out of town and you have the security camera. If something goes wrong, I really should help you manage the, you know, watch what's going on in your apartment. So dad would say to his daughter, Alice, is like, um, I, I need to, to help you. So, so in our model, dad will say to Alice's assistant, he says, ask Alice to notify me when um, her security camera detects motion. So he would say it in English, the request comes through, Alice's assistants look at this request, translates it into code, okay? So that is the code that says, this is what you want me to do, all right? So the next thing Alice's assistant does is that it checks against the access control policy is like, um, has Alice given dad the access control? But, you know, Alice is not an IT staff and she's not gonna write down all the things that anybody can do for his, for her, uh, on her uh, digital assets. But it doesn't matter because Alice can now, you know, if, if this, con this, this, this request is not already allowed, the Al Alice's assistant, Alice's uh, uh, almond, can go ask Alice if uh, that's allowed. So the whole idea here is that the request is going to be executed by Alice's assistant. Alice is, Alice's assistant is the only one that actually knows the passwords and it is supposed to just show the results to dad. But any time that you are executing a remote program, it is very vulnerable to security issues. But in this case, because the, because the code is so high level, Alice can actually take the code and translate it back into English fully, 100%, okay? and ask Alice if that is allowed. So here is an example of a sentence. Um, Dad wants to get notified when any event is detected on your security camera and has motion is equal to true. Okay, it's a little clunky, but it is exactly what this program says. And now at this point, Alice can say yes, can say no, but typically, you know, when you ask for something like this, if you think a little bit harder, um, you would real, Alice will realize it's like, no, I'm not going to let my dad look at my security and camera anytime he wants, but it is useful if I am out of town. Okay, so Alice can say only if I'm not at home. This clause of only if I'm not at home can be combined with the request, and that is saved into the policy. And this program is executed, and only if all the conditions are true will the result be sent to dad. Okay. So in other words, you no longer have to share your passwords if you want to share information with your friends, your secretary, your dad, and whatnot. Everything is done by the assistant and only the desired information or the, the allowed information is, to, is shared with the person who uh, 
you are willing to share with. And so this is roughly how it works. I don't have the time to go into it. Everything is very formal. We are actually using SMT, Satisfiability Modular Theory, in order to make sure that the request is satisfied by the policies that the user sets up. Okay. So in summary here is that um, we now have a privacy, IoT, uh, privacy architecture. The IoT data never leave the house if you don't want it to. And um, in this meantime, it allows you to share anything that you, your virtual assistant can get access to with fine grain access control all in natural language. Okay, so that's our third result. And um, what I want to summarize here is that we are putting out a new methodology and toolkit that allows people to write their own um, natural language interfaces and and the developers they own it okay I don't own it you take the tools that we have you can build your interface and you can put it on your own website your own app your own phone and so forth and if you care to if you want people to be able to access it via virtual assistant we have a privacy preserving virtual assistant called Almond that will execute this code locally and you don't have to worry about a, um, a proprietary platform um, that is intercepting the communication. And if desired, the same skills can execute on everything that we, uh, like the, the Amazon Alexa and Google and so forth. And as a matter of fact, we know how to take the skill that you put into Thinkpedia and have it automatically appear on Amazon and Google because uh, and using their third party um, platform. And um, hopefully many more uh, companies will have, would, would like to tap into these third party platforms. Um, and besides the general purpose of Alexa, uh, assistants like Alexa's and Google's and, and Siri and so forth. We imagine that the automobiles, the hotels, you know, they will also want to provide assistance um, by voice. And um, the same skill will also be available on messengers and Slack and so forth. So the whole concept here is to try to recreate the idea that all the skills are publicly available by, and, and accessible to everybody. Okay. So in summary here is that um, we have laid out this foundation for a lot of people to put information up by voice. And uh, we really need to, um, ex to expand this effort. And for that, we have this new lab, the Open Virtual Assistant Lab. It's a new affiliate program. And um, we are uh, looking forward to working with, our, with companies and getting sponsorships and try to build out this um, open voice internet with privacy protection. So, uh, thank you. <laughs>